It is uh, March 21st, 2024. This is a meeting of the Transportation Advisory Board of the Met Council. And um, uh, we have an agenda that's been published uh, both for the members of the tab and for the public. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved, Anderson. Second, Geisler. All right, we got a motion and a second to approve the agenda as published. Any further discussion? All those in favor of, of adoption of the agenda as published, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Agenda is approved. Uh, do we have anybody in the public, uh, in our audience, that wishes to speak to the tab about any matter of concern to them? Okay. Feel free to come forward if you want to speak with the tab. Seeing no one coming forward, uh, we'll move on to reports. Uh, brief report this week, this month from me. Uh, I was on that Met Council Governance Task Force and Best I can determine, nothing going on at the legislature on that issue. And uh, at least I've checked with certain uh, legislators that were involved in the process and nothing going on with the press of all the other business that they have going on up there that uh, that must have gotten parked somewhere. So that's about all I had from a chair's report standpoint. Um, and then we've got agency reports and I'll start with uh, uh, member Sahibdom. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'll make it quick. It's a, it's a good news. A lot of you probably have heard the region was uh, uh, lucky to receive a um, Reconnect Community Grant from federal government for a, a project from Trunk, for Trunk Highway 55, uh, which is also Memorial Parkway from Minneapolis all the way to West Metro. What's unique about this is uh, two different entities uh, went for it, applied for the grant and uh, both got it. <clears throat> and the federal government obviously thinks this is a important uh, uh, parkway, but what it does, so, so, so MnDOT uh, put in a request and we got 3.6 million. And one of our uh, um, um, nonprofit entities, uh, Our Streets Minneapolis also received 1.6 million uh, dollars. Uh, theirs is more for, for the Minneapolis portion, which is a project called Bring Sixth, uh, back um, and ours is more it includes Minneapolis Golden Valley and West Metro so it's going to require a lot of collaboration between the two agencies to make it uh, efficient to use those funds but that's all I have in the interest of time any questions from members based on that report all right thanks let's uh, move on we've got Todd Bewin with us today welcome back Mr. Thank Member you. Bewin, uh, uh, nothing to report MPCA. Mr. Chair from the MPCA this month. Nothing to report. All right. Little sidebar going here. I was trying to pay attention to that too. So nothing to report from MPCA. Uh, Member Crimmins, uh, Met Metropolitan Airports Commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I sent my report to Elaine earlier, so everything's on there uh, that she'll pass out. I just wanted to mention that we received another award from Airport Council International, third year in a row for best airport between the 20 and 40 million passenger group. And this is seventh out of eight years that we've received the award. So I don't know what happened to that one year, but we'll have to look at, we want a recount, I think. Every, every month you're getting an award from somebody. Yes, yeah, somebody, yeah. It must no, be a best good airport place to between them Wisconsin and North Dakota. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we just have coming. good staff, good staff. All right. Mr. Chair, I have a question, if I could. You, yes, Commissioner. The uh, possible pullout of uh, Uber and Lyft, May 1st, you know, I don't know if that's just an idle threat. It sounds like it's more than that, but how have you, are you talking about how that would impact the airport or what kind of impacts it would have on the airport? Or? Yes, it's been discussed. Uh, again, we, nobody knows how, when for sure, but we only have a couple hundred taxi cabs. So, we used to have 700, now we're down to 200. So because of that, I don't know how people are gonna get around in either public transportation or they're gonna to have to call a friend or I don't know what they're gonna do. We were discussing earlier, there's only 14 licensed taxis in Minneapolis. <laughs> so I don't know if, if they pull out of Minneapolis, there's only 14 people are gonna be working day and night. <laughs> so I, other than that, we don't know what we're gonna do. Yeah. Thanks for that. Anything further, Member Crimmins? No, sir. To point out? All right, good. Let's go to Deb, Bar uh, Deb Barber for the Metropolitan Council report. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just have a couple of quick things. Um, 
We are doing, in the process of doing a series of uh, regional solicitation listening sessions. We just had one this morning with the citizen reps on tab here, um, then out to Scott County, Washington County, Ramsey County, I think so far. But all told, there's going to be 30 of these listening sessions. And so just if you've got an invite to one of them, please participate. We're trying to get as many um, voices at the table as we can as possible so we can uh, figure out all these different factors and organizations as we look at sort of revisioning the next round for the next round of the regional solicitation. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is on Friday is the Met Council State of the Region um, event, which is being held at the Hopkins Center for the Arts. Um, there's an open house starting at 9 and um, a presentation and program starting at 10 a.m. And if you haven't gotten an invite, you're all invited and welcome to attend. Um, I think there'll be um, uh, plenty of accommodations. So I'd love to see some of you there on Friday morning. Mr. Chair, can I Very comment? Good. Commissioner. I just want to comment on the listening session. I, I, I really thought that it was well done. It is well done. They have a mentee... Um, sort of a poll on a variety of questions. And so it sort of standardizes the feedback, these li listening sessions. So I think it's, uh, you know, because of the structure of it is fairly comparable from, you know, how do they respond to these specific questions or so forth. I, so I thought it was very well done. Good, all right, Commissioner. Uh, I represent a Washington County on that same listening session call and I compliment <coughs> Steve and the team, very well done. Very good, all right. They don't Thank you. Credit for that. Enough, yeah. so, Thanks. You know, Thanks, Member Barber. Throw it out there. All right, Suburban Transit Authority, uh, Member Hanson, we're going to get you uh, get your report in before you have to leave here. So. That, that, that's okay, Mr. Chair. I, I suspect I won't want to watch much of that game today anyway. So um, <laughs> it's a tough game. Yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that um, um, MVTA provided uh, transportation to the, uh, the Burnsville First Responders uh, Memorial Service uh, in coordination with uh, other public transit and, and private providers. Uh, they provided transportation to the service for several of the, of the, the, the member cities' uh, first responders and, and staff and their families. So we are grateful for that. And then just one other quick point. Uh, Southwest Transit is working with Carver County to expand prime micro transit service to Waconia beginning early next year. And they are expanding uh, special events services to uh, include uh, Renaissance, Renaissance Festival service uh, this year. So that's it. All right, very good. Questions for Member Hanson? All right, and thank you for that uh, observation on the Burnsville first responders. It was uh, quite an event. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner. Sorry for the interruption, but I w was wondering why Connie didn't bring up MnDOT's award for the uh, best roads in the country with consumer affairs, okay. with the second lowest fatalities uh, per 100 million uh, miles driven. And then we heard from the airport and they brought up their award. So he's being <laughs> modest, <laughs> but I think MnDOT needs well, to be recognized <laughs> for that you. recognition. Thank you, Commissioner. You guys make a good team, I think. We do. <laughs> um, all right, well, thanks for bringing that up, Commissioner. That was uh, good of you to do that. All right, and then uh, uh, Brian Isaacson's here, our TAC Vice Chair. What? Oh, oh, excuse me, Member Foster. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if this is in the right order, but in response to the Uber and Lyft, their possible leaving, and the airport, we do have a relatively robust public transit system. Both the Green Line and the Blue Line run through the airport. They've been working on increasing security and safety on the trains in that spot. Metro Transit overall has been doing a really good job of improving safety and rideability and comfort on our system. So I also think this is a good opportunity to really start to connect the two of them even more than we already do. So I just wanted to name that. Yeah, good thought. Thank you. Thank you, Member Foster. Appreciate that observation. <clears throat> um, all right, now, uh, our TAC Vice Chair, Brian Isaacson, is with us today. And he may or may not have a report, I'm unsure. Not unsure. 
I'll just stand here for a couple minutes and not say anything, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, a very short, uh, we had a TAC meeting. It was, we discussed a number of things that are on our agenda today. So today you have two streamlined amendments on the consent agenda, and then we had, uh, I'll say, a fair amount of discussion on a couple of the topics that are on the agenda today. So unless there are other questions. Yeah, I think just stand by because the only thing between uh, you and the next phase where you're up is the minutes. So let's uh, okay. take, let's check the minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of February 21, Anderson. 2024? Seconded, Jenkins. All right, All right. Jenkins seconds. Uh, the, the approval of the minutes of February 21, 2024. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the minutes of February 2021, 2024, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Minutes are approved. Now we're back to you, Vice Chair Isaacson. Thank you. And we've let's cover these consent uh, uh, items. I think you could cover them sequentially, and then uh, we'll go into the main part of the agenda today, which is uh, information, more, more information than you may have anticipated. But uh, <laughs> right, it's going to be a rich afternoon here with information. So if I remember, and I, don't, I apologize, I, I wasn't anticipating speaking to him, but I can. <coughs> so item, the first item is, I believe, the Robert Street project. Yeah, and that is, I'll say, an amendment that moves MnDOT's money up in the time frame. Yeah, they're um, both MnDOT related projects. I think. Yeah, they're they're both MnDOT related projects. So yeah. Robert Street is a project that where MnDOT is moving some money forward in order to execute an agreement with St. Paul to keep that project on schedule and to get it in the right time frame. And so that's that amendment is largely an accounting exercise of money that MnDOT has under their purview. All right, and then um, I think 2024-14 is another MnDOT project that adds three projects, and I don't want to make you feel like you're in an awkward spot here. So oh, maybe the way to handle it is to ask uh, our colleagues whether anybody has any questions with respect to 2024, 13, or 14. All right. Yes. I don't have any um, Remember, Kim. questions, but certainly comments. Go ahead. Um, so uh, just to support um, this um, recommendation, but Robert is a really, really old street, and the construction downtown in St. Paul tends to involve lots of different surprises, like old rails, if you've ever seen the street get ripped up. Um, a lot of the loads of clean fill probably be needed to restore our subsurfaces, um, and our recent experiences with reconstructing Minnesota Street and Kellogg Boulevard indicate that a larger requested uh, a request of increased budget is appropriate and pertinent for the area. Um, and so just want to speak on behalf of and in support of this um, changeover. Yep, good. Thank you for those comments. Member Geisler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one question that did come up that we just wanted, I wanted to clarify here um, from the Monday meeting. So is this just a transfer of funding, and is St. Paul then going to take over the project? Is, that's the plan for how this amendment is going to go? So I'll do the best that I can, and I'll, I'll lean on Aaron Tag to, to make sure that I don't step out of turn. My understanding is that this is an agreement between St. Paul and Mendod. They're moving their money forward into a one into the end of one fiscal year, and that's about availability of funds, and that furthers the agreement for St. Paul to complete the project on on schedule. Okay. Thank you. That the project was not funded through the regional solicitation. These are state funds replacing federal funds. Remember, Kim? Correct. Yes. All right, thank you for that. Any other questions on 13 or 14? Is there a motion to adopt the items on the consent agenda in a single motion? So moved. Thank you, Second. Member Martinson. Second, Member Geisler, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of uh, the items on the consent agenda in a single motion say aye. 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 Carried, 2013, 2024, 13 and 14 are approved. And now we will move. Uh, thank you, folks. Yes, thank you, thanks. Mr. Vice Chair, glad to have you here with us. And let's move on then to um, the uh, first uh, informational item, and we're going to get some updates here from our uh, our work groups. And the first one is our colleague uh, Glenn Johnson, who's been running uh, the active transportation work group and uh, doing an excellent job of that, I might add. And so we'll wait. Uh, we'll await your report here on your activities. Uh, thank you, Chair Hovland. Um, I get to run the remote today. It's very exciting. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Actor Tanson Working Group. We've been. It's our second meeting now that we've had. Um, we're going to be meeting next week again for our third. And so I wanted to give just an overview of what we've been doing so far because there's been actually a lot of substantial stuff happening behind the scenes. Some of it's going to be coming to tab as recommendations, but of course we don't want to surprise you with anything. So we want to make sure that you're all updated about what we've been doing. So some. 
of this might be uh, information you've already seen because we've talked about active transportation sales tax money at TAB before, but we have new members. There's a lot of information, so I figured at least a little bit of a briefing on that would be good. So just to go back to who's on this group, so it is a group membership made up of TAB members, and you can see an extensive list of citizen, mode rep, as well as uh, some of our elected officials on here, uh, including Chair Hovland, who sits on there as well. And then we do get uh, really advisory information from all of our advisory group members, plus outside expertise. So at the, you'll see there's TAC members, but then also at the bottom, we did invite some of our bike ped work group members as well to give their expertise on what's happening. Um, they they work in parallel to us. We don't usually see what their work looks like, but it's great to have them there as well for their expertise. And I just want to thank all the members of this group because it's been very robust conversations, but everyone's bringing their own expertise in about here's this little piece that everyone else might not know about, and it's been a great dynamic for the two meetings we've had so far. So the goals of the AT work group, that's our shorthand we're using for this, um, we're really making recommendations to TAB on how the active transportation sales tax money will be spent. So the big thing out of this is $24 million per year for this purpose. Um, that's a, a big chunk of money. We see maybe larger for the regional solicitation, but this is a large amount of money. And so we want to be very conscientious about what our recommendations look like. And so we want to make sure that we're informing everybody here about what are we actually considering uh, as we go through. So we divided this up into immediate goals and long-term goals. And the reason we did that is because if you were on tab last summer, right after this legislation was passed at the state legislature, which said this is coming. This sales tax money is going to be starting collecting in uh, October of 2023. Uh, we had to make a lot of decisions about how this money was going to be spent. And so staff brought us a couple different ideas. This group said this is too soon to make a decision on this. We can't do that right now. And so that's why this work group has stood up to really answer some of these questions and get more input on that, which is what TAB had asked for uh, at that time. So the immediate goal we had was, should we spend some of this money in the 2024 regional solicitation? If we do, how much? What are the requirements? Those types of pieces. A second question, which actually did come up at that meeting last year was, should we have a special active transportation solicitation separate from everything else we've been doing, probably in 2025, because it would take a long time to set up. And out of those pieces, the one thing we've talked about so far is 2024. And you might say, why? Well, because we have to make decisions by this summer, because that's when the regional solicitation comes through. So we've been prioritizing that and really move the other pieces to longer term, just getting context for these types of pieces as we've been going through, but really focusing on that 2024 regional <laughs> solicitation piece. But I do want to say for the long term goal, we do have to make some decision, we're again, bringing it to TAB for a recommendation, which TAB will ratify, for what do we do long term? Should this line up with the 2026, 2028 regional solicitation cycle? Should it be separate from that? So ultimately, this work group will continue its work, not just through this summer, but through next year, in tandem with the policymaker work group, which Steve will talk about in a little bit here, uh, making sure that we're giving guidance to that group as well about what we're thinking about for this pot of money. <clears throat> So the legislative language, which you've probably seen before, I didn't want to go through all of this, but I do want to highlight that there's two requirements that staff informed us about last year and we've talked about at the work group that really are things that we would have to go to applicants to ask this information. And really just making sure it's not just a checkbox, but can you answer the question about how this, uh, you know, does, does more for project inclusion in a regional a plan? Or how does this promote uh, complete streets planning? So there are some considerations we'd have to go back to. But the work group decided these weren't insurmountable by any means for a 2024 solicitation, but it would require asking applicants for some additional information. So for the 2024 regional solicitation, the really specific questions we had were, you know, how soon can we spend these funds? And so the work group came back and said, you know, we really would like to spend this money sooner rather than later. Um, you'll see in a moment how much money this is. It gets to some very large numbers if we don't spend it quickly. So one of the considerations was we want to spend at least some of this early. And the second one is that, this was unknown last year, so I did want to call this out. And I remember Martinson you know, is, is nodding over there. This was a really big revelation for us because last year when we talked about adding this money into 2024 regional solicitation, it just seemed like it was adding extra money. One thing that became um, clear was that current regional solicitation federal dollars are managed, the grants are managed by MnDOT. So right now, we, we found out in the interim that these grant fundings for active transportation sales tax dollars will not be managed by MnDOT. Instead, Met Council will be in charge of it. Met Council doesn't have the apparatus set up for this yet. So one possibility would be 
could we do some sort of piloting level to build up some expertise so Met Council would be ready with whatever long-term plan we set up? So those are the two things we had for our main considerations. So this is where it gets a little more eye-popping, which how much money would be accruing. So if we didn't spend anything, we'd end up in the 2020, uh, 2030 period talking about $172 million that have been unspent. So the work group decided, as I said, this is just not something that we wanted to see. We want to make sure we're spending this money more quickly. But it's about $24 million per year is the estimate. So that's rolling in every single year. It's going into an account, more or less, that's coming over to Med Council. So it's money that's here <coughs> and is ready to be spent. Unlike our federal funds, which are all looking at future years, this money is already coming in and it's already accruing in the bank. So we asked staff to give us some possibilities of what this could look like. I'll talk about all three of them here in a moment. The first option is we just didn't spend any of it until we figure out the long-term plan. We don't figure this out until 2026 regional solicitation. The second one would be maybe we fund some projects. And we have some considerations what that could look like. And then the last one would be maybe we do some sort of we cover the share for local match, something along those lines. So very broadly, three options because we want to dig into them a lot more. But we did have some evaluations so far of what we're thinking. So we did want to keep option one, the do nothing in 2024 option in. This wasn't a popular option, but it is a possibility if we can't decide how to spend the money. So we want to keep it in the mix. But the big cons to this is we wouldn't get to test out any of the grant system through Med Council, and we would be accruing all of this money until project year probably 2028, maybe 2027, if someone, some municipality could spend it quickly. That felt like an exceptionally long period of time to be waiting to spend money, looking at five years past the time the legislation was put into effect. So option two was really the one we're exploring a lot further, which says, what if we put some money into the 2024 regional solicitation? Now, I do want to acknowledge we haven't confirmed any of the specific details to this, how much money, uh, any sort of value to, how much per project. But the general focus on this would be we want to spend some money in 2024 regional solicitation. And so again, this is sort of the opposite of what Tab talked about last year. So we want to give you our reasoning why uh, to this. So the biggest one, at least from the list here, is the grant management system. If Med Council suddenly is, staff is suddenly asked to do all the distribution of these funds, that's a big ask starting in 2026. So if we can do some level of piloting of that now, that's gonna be a big selling point. It's also out of all the options, spending the money the quickest. So one of the other pieces is in that conversation last year, we talked about, well, wouldn't a special 2025 regional solicitation provide that? Wouldn't that be the quickest? And the answer is it would not. It would actually be later than just putting some money into the 2024 regional solicitation. And so the part about this that we're still working out some of the details, it would provide funding that we could put directly into the bike ped projects right now. There's a gigantic long list of these projects, which I think we're going to pretty quickly find um, you know, some of the scoring for, but the possibility would be we could cover more projects if this is the case. So right now, this is what we're exploring further. We're meeting next week to hopefully finalize some details. And then that would be a recommendation that would come back to tab at one of the future meetings, either April or May, for a recommendation with the details included. But again, we don't know the exact amount of money. I think the conversation right now is around 10 to maybe 20 million at the outside uh, for covering some projects, but treating it like it's a pilot for covering this for the grant management program. And we've eliminated that third option, which is covering the non-federal match. And I'll give you a little color commentary on this part. One of the big conversation topics we had was about federalization of projects. If you federalize a project, there's a lot of other pieces that come into play, and it does delay the implementation of how fast you can spend the money. That's a major consideration, because even if the active transportation sales tax dollars were used to cover the local match, this still remains a federalized project, which still has that same concern of how quickly can you spend <coughs> the money. And even with this, though, we'd still have the concerns about would we manage the grant funding locally with Met Council. So again, this one doesn't meet some of the key requirements we wanted. So we were able to, as a group, eliminate this option, keep the other two in contention. So our preferred option at this point is to spend some money of, uh, again, details to BD, but to figure out some of the money that could be spent in the 2024 regional solicitation on bike ped projects with some of the details coming sooner. The recommendation here, um, we want to make sure we're meeting the requirement of getting this done by summer. As I mentioned, that's a really important consideration. We need to get this done in time to actually put it into the, the system to be able to talk about it during our approval of the projects that are going to be funded. And that's going to happen this summer. Uh, 
The other part to this is we do have some of this ongoing work that we're going to be combining into the 2026 regional solicitation process. So we're gonna to continue to be meeting. Um, one of the big things we had early on was how fast we wanna be working. Um, we were talking about doing meetings every two weeks when we first started to meet this deadline. Um, we're now at a monthly cadence, which seems like a much more manageable process. Um, but one of the things I do wanna point out is we wanna make sure that there's time for any decisions we make to come to TAB, then having uh, guidance given by uh, TAC funding and programming, uh, TAC as well, to say, are there any problems you highlight and you want TAB to be aware of, to make sure we still have those deadlines. So expect a, an action item from this work group to be coming in either April or May coming up. And that is the end of the presentation for today. Again, I don't have our contact information on here, but I do want to point out that last link here. We do have a web page set up. Joe Whiting, who's managing everything behind the scenes, has set up a page. If you want to know anything we're working on, there are very detailed minutes. I mean, I, I've taken minutes on, on meetings. This is extensive. So if you have any question about what's going on, please go in there. We want to make sure there's no surprises for TAB. We want to make sure we're being transparent with this group so you know exactly what we're doing and what we're thinking. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yes, thanks, Member Johnson. Member Geisler has a question for you. Uh, just overarching, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about what role does funding play for some of these, are we gap filling small projects, big projects, huge regional things, and active transportation is one of those spots. I know we, we talked about it just a little bit ago about, you know, uh, a bicycle network that has gaps is kind of a moot point to some extent for transportation. Has the group tried or started talking at all about what kinds of projects? I mean, it sounds like, you know, you're looking at a little parts here, but I mean, from, a, from an administrative standpoint, you'd think one big grant is much easier to administrate than potentially some, a bunch of small ones. Is, has that discussion been part of that yet? Some, yes, Chair, thank you. Um, the, the biggest thing I think that we've come up with is what's the sweet spot for the pilot? So we've asked staff and like eight to 10 projects will be ideal. So you have some variability in the details to them, but then you'd also have, again, not in a, 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 such a huge number that'd be tough to manage at this point. So that seems to be where we're, we've been discussing it. Um, to expand on that a little bit though, the other consideration we have is, you know, we didn't talk about it in, in this particular presentation because it's not gonna be applicable for 2024. But if we pursue a 2025 solicitation or the long-term piece, these funds are very different than the federal, not just because they're not federal, but because they can be used for different things. There are very few restrictions on it. And I'll give an example. You know, we talk about infrastructure for almost everything. These are you know, capital improvement projects. We're building a, a bike lane, for example. Um, with these dollars, you could fund operations. And that is just categorically very different than anything that TAB currently does. So we want to make sure that we're thinking very broadly in the long term, in the media 2024 solicitation, keeping it really focused on this. But to your point, the, we want to get some variability of the projects, hopefully, so that staff has a chance to try out a few different things with different partners and those types of pieces. Good, thanks. Uh, Member Jenkins has a question as well. So you just mentioned funding of operations. Is Met Council going to have to develop a team, resources, in order to manage those grants? And will they be able to scale up in time for us to do this in 24? And who funds that development if Met Council needs to? Thank you, Chair. Um, so the biggest thing in this, and I will defer to probably Steve to come up and answer some of these questions. The answer is they do need to stand this up. I don't know the details on that, so. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, thanks to Member Johnson and, and Vice Chair Martinson doing a great job. You can, you can see right here. Um, we do have to, uh, part of the reason why we, we uh, thought about this pilot was because we needed, needed some time and a small amount of projects to get our house in order um, from both legal procurement to other agreements, going out and checking the projects. And we can't forget all the things that state aid does for us, uh, which is real, which uh, we're, we're it's very fortunate that uh, state aid does all of our projects. But um, so I think that's the reason. So we've, we do have one person we've already hired and um, some of the work will be absorbing um, kind of with existing funds. And then we'll, we'll see from there kind of what the needs may be. But, but um, in the short term, we do have, we do have one uh, finance person on board here to help us. Anything further, Member Jenkins? No, nope. okay. that answers my question, thank you. Member Martinson and Vice Chair of this group, you've been nodding your head to 
enthusiastically and in an affirmative way. I thought maybe you might have something you wanted to add. Well, ch Chair, uh, th thank you, Chair. And uh, member and Chair Johnson has done such an excellent job. There's really not much to add. I just wanted to support this idea that I voted against putting money in it from the 24 last time around. And I did because I didn't have a sense of how that was going to be used well. But when staff made very clear to us this need or the benefit of a pilot, for them with a pilot with doing some projects to gain that experience with the grants management. Having worked with grants management most of my career, I understand the complexities of it. It is a specialized set of tasks and it is not something that you can just step into. They need to, they, there's gonna be a learning curve and they need to get there and this will help them do that. And that's the best reason that I can find to, to do this the way that we've kind of set it up. I also wanna note something that Member Holberg whispered in my ear that option three is off the table also because it would, it would reflect a violation of the legislation of supplanting funds, which is not allowed. So thank you. All That's right, it. very good. Uh, any other questions for Member Johnson? All right, yes, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have several, um, Am I interpreting the two million, at least the committee for now, the two million, that's the maximum size of the project or is it the maximum size of the request? That would be the maximum Request. size of the project, I believe, for that one. Okay, and then two I million. mentioned uh, you're thinking of financing operations. I don't quite understand operations of a project. Uh, Member Johnson, yeah, bear thank with you, me Chair. Elaine. So this would be, and this came up in the discussion uh, last year, but this would be the possibility that you could do a snow removal program. You could do a bike share program. You could cover the operations, not just the capital cost to set up those programs. Um, that is different than the current federal funding. So within a particular project, you know, this is really about what would the long-term Again, would it be like you get three years of funding for a particular project for setting it up plus operating it for that time span? That would be yeah, what we were talking about. That's my problem with operations. They're kind of ongoing. <clears throat> and then uh, yeah. assuming if you keep it to projects, that's my last question is at $24 million, $2 million cap, that's 12 projects amongst the metro area. Uh, and I don't have a problem with that, but I think there should be some guardrails to get some geographical balance. What's going to, you know, I, I think that's a lot of projects. We just need to have some sort of balancing of <clears throat> we spread the money around. Uh, I'm all for it. Certain areas are going to be justified and have better projects. It doesn't have to be even, Stephen, but you got you know, some, some guardrails. Robert Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Hovland. So again, it'd be every, if we decided to follow the pattern of the regional solicitation with every other year, that would be $48 million. So even at that cap, there'd be 24 projects that'd be coming through. So again, I think part of the, the long-term conversation is, you know, do we <clears throat> follow the same rules that are set up? I mean, even the current rules that are set up about, you know, what do we consider for uh, geographic balance? You know, do we do something different? Do we still stay attached onto the regional solicitation process? There's lots of questions for that long-term piece. So again, we're just making a list of questions at this point of things that we have to continue discussing. Um, we're just we're focusing on that for the longer term goals. And then we're focusing on these immediate things for the 2024 regional solicitation. And, and do we want to do a special 2025? But that would be a consideration too about how do we allocate the money if we pursued a 2025 regional solicitation. <clears throat> Thank you. Elaine, you had a comment you wanted to make. Right. I was just going to add in with the uh, federal funds that you receive, there's eligible elements and TAB uh, makes a decision of what they want to fund so they don't fund everything eligible with the federal funds. Example is right away is eligible. TAB does not fund right away except for transit type projects. And so with the active transportation, there's this wide open of what's eligible TAB through their it's ongoing active transportation work group and then to tab, they will determine who becomes eligible or what types you want to fund. All right. and, and Chair Johnson, is it in the intent then of the working group, once you get finished with your work, to come back to the tab and uh, get an approval process for both short-term and long-term strategies? 
Yes, Chair Avalon, that would be the plan. I think, again, the immediate plan um, for 2024, we, we had urgency on this because we know we have to turn this around quickly. So we would expect that in the next couple of months. But if we decided that a 2025 regional solicitation uh, was going to, we would recommend that that would happen. You know, there's another timeline that comes into place. We would have to have that set up by the end of the year, um, which is a very quick turnaround. I mean, that's an ask of staff. So we wouldn't want to linger on that. So I think at the, I, I don't want to like promise this exactly, but I think there's probably three broad recommendations recommendation we bring, which would be the 2024 regional solicitation recommendation, a recommendation on the 2025, if we decided that would be a good idea, and then the long-term, how does this mesh with the, the long-term plan for the 2026 and onward regional solicitation? So at least three, um, but I think it's probably periodic updates and then these action items. All right, good. Yeah, you know, thanks for that clarification on process. Did that prompt anything else from anyone? I, so one thing I just wanted to mention too is that because we have we have members of TAC involved in that working group with us, we are getting their input on this as we go through this whole process as well. So our, our objective would be to bring an action item here for TAB hopefully next month, provided our, provided our next meeting goes as smoothly as the first two have. So. Very good. Yeah, Commissioner. And I, I just want to add from a county perspective, we've started some conversation around the issue of the fact that counties are receiving uh, direct appropriations from this fund as well. And we as counties, it's gonna take us a while to figure out what we're gonna do with our direct appropriations. So some of this stuff is just gonna take time as different elements firm up, whether it's the uh, 26 solicitation new standards but counties are, I mean, it, there's there's some ability to have some synergy or uh, mm -hmm. building off e each, uh, you know, what each entity is going to do or not. Um, so I think it's, some of this is go fast, but some of the other stuff is just going to take some time. Commissioner, from a legal standpoint, do you know whether there would be an ability to, to be partners on projects and, and uh, contribute funds both from the active transportation funds that the Met Council is getting uh, with county funds to create a project in a particular county, let's, say, let's use your county as an example. Well, I'm certainly not a lawyer. I used to laugh and say I played one at the legislature, but um, some people didn't think that was too funny. But anyway, um, I mean, I think that the uh, parameters of the law are pretty broad, um, the not supplanting, and I had put a call into Chair Johnson about my concern about that um, as an issue that I don't, th I, I think we can't just take this money and supplant local match that was included as part of the solicitation process. I'm thinking we might run into some problems um, with that. But I think moving forward, being able to collaborate and mm -hmm. um, and then of course we have the cities at the table that are not getting a, a direct appropriation and I mean I just think I mean one of the ideas was well cities don't wouldn't have to do a match but counties do because they're getting this money and I said well in a matter of seconds you'd have the counties telling the cities to be the applicants <laughs> to avoid you know the, the match so I, I think there's not it's gonna take time yep okay all right, this is some exciting work you're all doing. Thank you for it. Um, all right, let's uh, move on then to the um, uh, next matter that we have in, uh, in the informational portion of our agenda, and that's the uh, report out from Steve Peterson on the policymaker work group. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and two quick points before the information items. Uh, first, uh, tomorrow at funding and programming, the uh, one and only appeal that we received for this ongoing solicitation will be heard. And so shortly thereafter, we will have uh, ranked lists and scores. So probably next month uh, to tab, we we'll, uh, you can get a first glance at those. So that's always exciting. Uh, number two, more of the long term, this policy group that we've asked for volunteers for that we're looking to start in late April or early May, meet roughly once every three months. Um, we did receive about, we've got 18 volunteers from this committee uh, uh, 14 of which are TAB members, four council members. So I think we have plenty plenty of volunteers, which is great. I'm just doing a final check uh, with you, Chair Hovland, on the side to, uh, to look over the list, but I'd expect in the next week we'd send out that first invite uh, for the first meeting. All right, very good. So, Questions for Mr. Peterson? 
I'm just sure. curious what entity ch challenged the scoring and what project. Elaine, I believe that was the Hopkins, wasn't it? <clears throat> hmm. The city of Hopkins? I think it was. <coughs> yeah, I think it was. Yeah. And it was, I'm trying to think which score it was. Fun fact, just yeah. curious. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, you got us all curious. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we did get several inquiries on the methodology, but there was only one that actually appealed. Okay, thanks, Mr. Peterson. All right, then we got Dan Erickson with us from MnDOT who's gonna bring us up to date. They gave us a federal aid update. Should be interesting. Thanks, Mr. Erickson, for being here with us again. Thank you very much, Mr. <clears throat> Chair. Um, don't get your hopes up too high, though, I'll just say that. <laughs> so I am Dan Erickson. I am the Metro District State Aid Engineer um, in State Aid, and uh, we're different than our CO State Aid people, but we're kind of in the same locale, so we kind of overlap a little bit at the same time. So I assume I just hit the forward button here to get it to go? All right. So first off, to start off a little bit, it's been a number of years since I've been here, um, pre-COVID to be exact, and when you throw COVID in there, I kind of lose track of time over that time. So it's been a while, right? Um, but I thought I'd start with a little bit of history. And so in state aid, we process all the federal aid projects with our local partners. And over the last few years, Metro State Aid has averaged processing about 39 federal aid projects per year. This is the past few years. Um, that's worth a total federal funding of about 83 million per year and a program construction value of about $202 million. So that's kind of the, what we've been doing. Uh, in fiscal year 24, that has changed quite a bit. We have 90 federal aid projects this year, and I'll show you a table in a second that'll kind of show this all better. But um, there's 79 individual lettings and 11 tied projects. That still means we have 90 projects. It just means some of them were combined into one letting. Um, there's $148 million of federal funding. Uh, program construction costs of 490 million, almost half a billion dollars. And this year we've begun, pro begun work on 30 projects for 2025. As projects become more complex and larger, we need more development time and so we start working with them ahead of their actual program year. So you'll see that theme come out a little bit. So this table is just kind of a summary. So this is where the data came from. So a total of 21, 22, and 23, we averaged it out. That's the 39 projects <coughs> at 83 million of federal funds. You can see that in 24 and 25, when we average that out, we're essentially doubling the program. Um, the amount of federal funds is doubling plus, um, and, the, and the construction cost is you know going two and a half times or whatever it is. And so basically what this is saying is uh, between the regional solicitation, the congressionally directed spending, IIJA, the federal program has just ballooned um, tremendously. And so along with that, um, we're gonna get into more complexities, more coordination, uh, a whole bunch of stuff that comes along with that. So anyways, my main objective with this was to kind of tell you where we are with the 24 program, but I wanted to give you the background too that it's getting a lot bigger really quick here. And so anyways, with the fiscal year 24 projects, we have 90 of them, um, if you remember that slide, but 64 of those projects we still have to authorize. And we're getting, you know, towards the end of March here, uh, typically we'd have a little smaller um, number as far as amount of projects that we still have to authorize. 64 is a lot. It is, if you'd notice, more than we typically do in a typical year over the last few years. Um, we are not quite panicked, but we are concerned, right? So that's, that's kind of a message for you. Uh, we still have 35 environmental documents to approve. Um, if you talk to the FHWA, we really shouldn't even be really getting into development of plans until we have an environmental document in place. Um, and then we've got 40, 45 plans to approve. So all this is to say, not only do we have a huge program this year, but we got a lot of work to fit into the last quarter of the fiscal year and uh, um, you know, things keep popping up. We just had the, uh, the bill a couple weeks ago, that the federal bill that got passed, and that uh, included 13 projects in the metro area that uh, got some congressionally directed spending. Two of those were 2024 projects. That mean we have to find a way to get them into the STIP as fast as possible so that we can authorize them in the next three months. 
um, so that they can, so that our local partners can utilize that money when they deliver their project. And so all of this still hanging out there, um, they're all in various, they're all at various stages, right? Some of them are further along than others. Some of them are probably sending plans in next week. Some of them we're pushing out um, into June, but it's gonna be very busy spring in state aid. So added complexities, as I've kind of alluded to, as we progress um, with larger <coughs> programs, more funding sources and that sort of thing. So um, more funding sources and, and requirements we're faced with, there's basically eligibility and timing that come into play with each one of these funding sources. And so you've got congressionally directed spending, legislative money, um, the legislative money, some of that is the active transportation that is being handled through the Met Council, but we have the same thing on the state aid side where we basically have what we call earmarks, um, and that funding can be utilized many different ways. It can go for pre-design, design, construction, but when it's construction and it's on the federal aid project, um, there's grant agreements that have to be put in place. There's uh, providing MMB with um, proof that you have full funding for that project. There's a process that goes along with that. Uh, they all have different sunset dates as far as when the money goes away and when you have to use it by. Um, and so we have to fold all of this together. So as an example, um, I'm, I'm going to a Trunk Highway 65 meeting tomorrow. And you guys are well aware of Trunk Highway 65 and all the work that's going to be done up in Blaine, right? But that's got HSIP funding, it's got uh, local, um, it's got some of our MnDOT, um, local program money, it's got two regional solicitation uh, fundings, it's got geo bonds, it's got trunk highway bonds, it's got general funds, it's got two different congressionally directed spending, it's got raise and it's got quarters of commerce. And each one of those come <laughs> covering a different portion of the project and a, a different timeline of when it's available and when it has to be used by, and, and, and that's kind of probably one extreme of the projects that we face, right? But we do have a whole, you know, Trunk Highway 8 will be another one that has a, a lot of complexity. Um, Trunk Highway 5 out in Carver County will have a lot of complexity. We just delivered 212, which had some complexities. And so uh, that's just a, a taste, a flavor, I guess, of how we have to take this jigsaw puzzle of funding and the availability of where it can be spent and the eligibility of that funding and try to piece that to fully fund a project. A lot of times we have enough money for a project, it's just trying to get all the money to fit together correctly so that we can actually deliver the project. Um, some other things that have come up recently, transit line and FHWA project coordination. Transit lines, you guys are well aware, there's a lot of transit lines in the works. Um, you guys are selecting projects that, FHWA projects that are more site specific, I'll say, and we're running into issues with um, FHWA and the NEPA process and that our FHWA projects, the, the issue wasn't really with our projects coordinating and getting the elements um, inserted into whatever project that is. It's more with the coordination of the NEPA process and being able to not predetermine line um, stop locations, I guess, with our FHWA projects. And so we've been in multiple, multiple meetings um, directly with FHWA and uh, Met Transit and ourselves in state aid, and we're just trying to both project-specific meetings and more program programmatic meetings, and we're trying to work our way through that, okay? So that's a, something that's just kind of come up lately. Um, bats, bees, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, we all know the environmental process, and they're just kind of layering more requirements on our local partners in the deliverability. U.S. Fish and Wildlife has kind of a they, do we just become aware of kind of a bottleneck there where they're gonna look at one project at a time, and when they get done with that one, they'll look at the next one. We have multiple projects in the metro area that need to be looked at by Fish and Wildlife. So State Aid um, and MnDOT are working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to try to establish another position to help with that, and, but that's gonna take some time. But these are all things that are going on behind the scenes to keep things moving. Tip and step coordination. I don't know how familiar you are, you all, how familiar you all are with that, but every time something gets some more money or a cost increases, uh, scope changes, uh, all of that, we need to modify the tip and the step so that eventually, you know, it's in that document correctly, but eventually we can authorize that project and what the lo locals want to want to deliver. Um, along with that, MnDOT's got a program called Chimes, 
I'm not gonna get into it too much, but all the same information with more detail has to be in Chime so that MnDOT can authorize it. So it's kind of a layered effect and it gets really complex and I don't even pretend to understand it, but I have people that understand it, right? Which is the main thing, right? You gotta have people, right? So anyways, but it's another thing. Um, staffing, I think we all um, have had staffing issues over the last few years and state aid is working to, um, to staff up. I'll say we've been approved for a couple more positions. We're actually up to about six and a half in Metro state aid um, equivalents for the federal aid program. Right now we've got about one and a half of those that are vacant and we're posting one of those positions for the third time trying to find anybody that will apply. Not anybody, we don't want just anybody because that can be more detrimental than having nobody, right? We all know that too. So anyway, so it, it's all those same staffing issues. Um, to go along with all the issues that I've kind of talked about. It's kind of a, um, does it keep me up at night? Yes, a little bit sometimes, right? And so we're all, we're all dealt, we all have to deal with that at some point. Programming, I don't have that bullet on here. I added that later, but you know, programming all these projects and uh, the first year of the STIP and now the first two years of the STIP have to balance out to zero and we have to juggle projects. We have to be in contact with our local partners to um, either delay some funding or um, move projects up if we have a seed projects or that sort of thing, it's a juggling act. Um, the one thing I will say is the over-programming that this group does when you do your regional solicitations, very helpful so that we have kind of a, a bullpen of projects to pull forward when we need to utilize money. That, uh, that's a very good thing. Um, so anyways, any questions on any of that? <laughs> any questions on all of that? <laughs> I, I can meet any, after. I don't think any of us are buying into this self-deprecation strategy well, you're using here. It's, As a metro district engineer, we think you you know exactly what's going on. Well, there's a lot going on, and I'm responsible for very little of it. I'll just yeah. say that. So uh, I think there probably are some questions, but I've got one. Do you do you get data around? And this is something I'm just worried about. We're about halfway through the IIJA, and uh, so when you when your meetings, like I've been off and on with USDOT. People, you know, they're encouraging states and, and every governmental uh, uh, entity to be taking advantage of this last run on IIJA. And I wonder if you see any data around how, how our state is doing, how governmental entities in our state are doing relative to other states, and are we making sure that we're as aggressive as we can be on trying to get are, are access getting, to that funding? Are we getting our share? Is that what you're asking? That's another way to put it. Yep, yeah. yep. Um, I have not seen any data regarding that and whether Minnesota in general or the metropolitan area is getting its share. Um, John. Oh, John's back there. I didn't yeah. even see John sitting back there. Yeah, I'm hiding out back there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. actually, Welcome Minnesota's back. doing quite well. So John Solberg, I'm the Assistant Division Director for Sustainability Planning and Program Management at CO. Yeah. Right? He's he not used to part be down the hall, but now he's so far. Um, but right now, as it sits after uh, our latest rounds of IIJA funds, we are sitting at third most amount of money um, allocated to a state in the nation. So hmm. uh, you got Kentucky and California ahead of us. So we're doing very well. Okay. And are you getting requests for assistance on, on grant writing or any you know submissions that from other from governmental levels of government that? wouldn't necessarily have the ability to do it themselves, smaller cities, for example? Yeah, we, we, there's a program that uh, is available that's out there. I don't know what the numbers are mm -hmm. of uh, local communities that have asked for that help. Um, again, part of it is it's a grant, so there's paperwork to get the money mm -hmm. to be able to write an application. So there's, there's complications just in its own process from that standpoint, but um, it's available. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a IIJ grant assistance program that the legislature established that local agencies can receive some funding to hire a consultant or whatever to pull an application together. I, I know USDOT has created a dashboard that attempts to make it easier for different levels of government to uh, to apply, but nonetheless, it would be good to know that it, that cities and counties could get your assistance if it was necessary. Yeah, we've done the best we can. Our, our CEO state aid um, office has a web page that has a link to all the different NOFOs, to all the different, you know, some backup data, some other projects that have been selected that might be helpful for others that are applying. It's got a link to the uh, technical assistance program. It's got a link to the IIJA match program. It's got, it's kind okay. of a one-stop shop for all of that information. Oh. And I, I look at it every couple of weeks and learn, learn something new every time I look at it. All right. Good, good to know. Thanks. And uh, 
Mr. Solberg, thanks for that good information. It's nice Thank to know Minnesota's uh, <clears throat> up near the top. Um, all right, other questions for Mr. Erickson? All right, thanks for being with us. Can I just add a couple more things? So I just wanted to leave with a couple points. Sure. So just a, a couple things. You, you've seen the program and how crazy it's getting and that sort of thing. So a couple plugs I would like to put in is, you know, even sometimes the small projects are a, a, a lot of, they still have to go through all the different steps of the process. And so they're not necessarily any easier. They're easier than Trunk Highway 65 example that I used earlier, but they're not necessarily easy. And so um, I, I would, I would, I guess ask you to consider increasing the maximum amount of federal that you give to projects. We, we saw from the one slide um, that we're about half a billion dollars uh, this year and the amount of federal, we're, we're, we went from about 41% in the last few years, we're down to about 35% is the amount of federal on those projects. And so there is a lot of room to add federal money to those projects and it might, um, I'm not really looking to do less projects in the Metro, but if we can put more federal on some of the projects, and this might be a dirty word, right? Maybe defederalize, but maybe at a higher level, you know, and also do the defederalization, maybe allow some of that, but try to, uh, at, a, at a programmatic level, deal with some of these issues we're, we're all dealing with, with delivering this program. We heard earlier from Glenn that you know, the reasons they're not adding the extra transportation to federal projects because it, it does uh, take more to deliver a federal project and it'll delay deliverability. And so um, as a region, I think strategically, we, we could look at the way we distribute money a little differently. And our local partners are getting a ton of money through the legislature right now. And I think they would still do that. They would just need less of it on these federal projects and they would get it for other projects and we'd have more state funded projects to go along with the federal aid funded projects. So that's my two cents, two bits to think about, I guess, as I, as I leave you here. But anyways, I appreciate the time immensely. I thank you. And uh, one last chance for any questions. Yeah, well, it prompted one for me, and that is, have you suggested to our, our staff the, uh, the, the level you'd like to see for a maximum grant? You know, well, the, the, how much we'd like, how much you'd like to see us raise it? You, you probably don't want to ask me, <laughs> but at the same time, I, I think that, I think we should have that discussion. I, I you know, I, I don't. We we have not to this point. Um, I just feel like it's finally um, we've seen that light that we thought was at the head of the at the end of the tunnel, and it turns out it's a train, right? And it's about to hit us right in the eyes this year. And twenty five looked a little better. But just like the last bill that passed and we got 13 more projects with congressionally directed spending, they're gonna pop up. We're gonna have more IIJ pay up, pop up. So that those 77 projects in, uh, in 25 are probably gonna get closer to 90 by the time we get there. So All right. anyways. <clears throat> okay, well, yeah, if, to the extent you have any right. suggestions, share them with Mr. Peterson. Oh, for sure, for sure. We talk regularly and so yes, we will talk about it. So. Okay, very right. good. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mr. Erickson. Oh, Member Geisler. Uh, Mr. Erickson, Mr. Erickson, <laughs> want to come back, please? Uh, may, maybe to dovetail off the chair's question, I, I, I guess I, I hear your request to make it a little bigger. I, I guess my question is, what's the floor? Well, at what point does it become more expensive to administer funding these out? And so projects below a certain threshold just don't make a lot of sense for the state to be investing in. And I think you don't have to answer that now. But I think if we're gonna make a recommendation for the regional station going forward, understanding anything below here of project type, you know, because it, it does matter, it's not worth it or it is very expensive to do so as a proportion, that would be a good data point to have. Yeah, well. I'll just say that anecdotally, I have heard from um, some of our local partners that they won't apply for less than $500,000 of federal funding. Now, that might not necessarily change some of our solicitations because typically you know they're up above that but I'm I'm thinking of our 10 million dollar um, awards that they could be much higher than that right and I'm not saying a hundred million but you know they could be significantly more than 10 million and like I say I, I believe that it wouldn't necessarily I know we're all concerned about geographic equity and we want to pick projects everywhere and that sort of thing I don't know that it would resu result in fewer projects I think it would just free up the legislative money that our local partners are needing to request on those projects that we federalize, they would request it on other projects. Um, and so I think it would, we'd still have metro-wide the same amount of projects, they would just have different funding involved with them. 
So if, if I may sure. just to rephrase that, this table may fund fewer projects, but the projects may still happen through other means. Correct, correct, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. I mean, our local partners are gonna deliver everything they possibly can, right? And they're gonna use every resource that they have. And right now, this is a, a chip that they can that they can get. It's a smaller chip than I would hope it could be, right? That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and Member Steve, so, Yes, uh, <clears throat> it's not a question, just a comment. Uh, the, uh, because of these complications that, that, that you heard, I think organically delivering of projects in the region is, is changing. By organically, I mean uh, it, it used to go through a certain process and, and there's a color of money, there's jurisdictional ownership and all these things that causes people to be, become defensive and, and not let things go as smooth as possible. I think things have changed where we, for example, many of our MnDOT uh, projects like, um, like Dan said at the legislature, local agencies asking for general fund do dollars so they could do work on trunk highway, uh, to improve a trunk highway project. Um, and, or they put their own local, a county may feel that this is a great advantage to them economically, locally, to make improvement on the trunk highway. It's not their road, it's our job to do it. They have come talk to us and we said, well, we can't get to that because of all these other things. So that's, uh, uh, and, and I appreciate that where we can, we can do more and we've had, we've had counties, um, some do more, some do less, where a project may be 120 plus million dollars, eventually construction costs, and MnDOT only has $5 million in it. It's hard to believe, but that's, that's reality. And I truly appreciate that, and that's how things get gets done for the citizens of those uh, um, counties, and we can do that. And, they, and then the locals will take the time to use their own local state, to local county tax, and they go to Washington, D.C. and get federal money, and all these other funds and then deliver it uh, for us. And I certainly appreciate that and I think it's a great way of delivering uh, projects in the, in, in the, in the region and uh, early collaboration, and early relationship I think is very important. And again, that we don't become so defensive in all our, again, color of money and jurisdictional ownership. <laughs> Ultimately to the citizens, it doesn't matter who owns it as long as they can get to where they wanna go, so. Thank you, member. Received him. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to Katie Roth and get our uh, ABRT update. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Hovlin and members. Um, thank you for the time today. My name is Katie Roth. I'm the director of Arterial BRT at Metro Transit. Um, so that is all the lines that start with letters. And my presentation today is a little bit of an update on the program, but really providing the context for uh, our <coughs> submission for the 2024 regional solicitation for the Arterial BRT set aside, which is the H line. Um, so just to zoom out a little bit, uh, the H line will be the eighth planned line in our arterial BRT network. Um, as member Barber has mentioned to this group, we have the AC and D lines in operation, and these have all really been a bright spot in terms of ridership for Metro Transit, especially across the years of the pandemic and as we emerge, um, we're really seeing that these continue to be resilient services that serve a great number of people in the region. Um, we currently are getting ready for a 2024 construction season that will focus heavily on the B line along uh, Lake Street and Lagoon Avenue in Minneapolis. After last year, we had a lot of work on Selby and Marshall Avenues in St. Paul. We also have the E line where construction is getting underway this year um, between the U of M and Southdale. So two big construction projects this year, two lines that will open for the public next year in 2025. And then, um, the next set of projects, the F, G, and H lines, those were a result of a very comprehensive planning effort that Metro Transit undertook in 2020 and 2021 called Network Next. Um, this really aligned with TAB's direction and decision at that point to um, identify the larger set aside for an arterial BRT project. And that set aside coupled with this larger planning effort allowed us to put several projects into that pipeline. 
Um, so the F and G lines were previously submitted to the regional solicitation, uh, with now the H line being the priority that we're submitting this year. So the F, G, and H lines are those lines that are highlighted in green on this map here. I'll go into just a little bit more detail on each of these and then spend a little bit more time on the H line and also speak at the end to how we're planning to identify those next projects in the pipeline for future funding cycles. Uh, so the F, G, and H lines, as I mentioned, since identifying these in 2021, we've made a lot of progress working with our local partners on these projects. Um, we've worked quite a bit with Dan Erickson at State Aid. Um, we've worked with the Robert Street downtown project that was part of the consent agenda on the Rice and Robert Street project. Um, really, we touch a lot of other investments in the region. And so that early identification of projects is a really key way that we can best align this investment with other things that are happening. Um, on the F line in particular, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on the next slide about um, the schedule and some of the coordination we're doing with MnDOT there. Um, but in addition to the regional solicitation funding that was awarded to this project in 2021, we've also since entered the federal funding pipeline. And this project is in project development as a small starts project through the Federal Transit Administration. Um, and I, I see the, the members over here tracing on the map. So I should just uh, mention a little bit more where these lines go. Uh, the F line goes from downtown Minneapolis up to Blaine along Central and University Avenues. Uh, the G line up next is a north-south project that connects from Dakota County up to Ramsey County along Rice and Robert Streets. Um, we've got a lot of coordination with agency partners ongoing on Rice Street, on Robert Street downtown, on Robert Street south of the river with MnDOT, and in Dakota County. Um, we also are in the position of this project being fully funded as a result of the 2023 bonding bill uh, that passed through the legislature last year. Um, and then next up, the H line, of course. Um, I'll get into another map on this project with more detail of where this goes, but it's an east-west connector um, that really knits together a lot of other lines in the network. And that'll be our, our 2024 regional solicitation project that we've submitted to TAB. <coughs> Um, so a little bit more on some of the recent coordination that we've been going through with MnDOT along the Metro F line. Uh, so this is a project that would run primarily on two MnDOT trunk highways, uh, Highway 65 uh, Central Avenue and Highway 47 University Avenue. MnDOT has been undergoing a very um, extensive planning effort to look at ways to improve safety, improve multimodal accessibility along these corridors. And as of January of this year, MnDOT has made the decision to program some funding to deliver major multimodal improvements on a portion of Central Avenue in Columbia Heights. They are also seeking funding to continue those improvements um, within the city of Minneapolis on Central Avenue, really encompassing everything that's shown in that blue box on the map. Um, with this, we have an opportunity to align the F-line construction with this broader investment that's being made along Central Avenue. Um, however, where we had, we had previously identified that the F-line could open as early as 2026, we now anticipate that that would be moved out to better align with this schedule. Um, so Central Avenue construction under MnDOT's leadership is planned to begin in 2028, and we plan to jointly develop a construction schedule and a financial plan for both Central and University Avenues, working closely with MnDOT as we have been since um, the F-Line was prioritized and awarded that first regional solicitation funding from TAB. So as a result of this, we will be um, identifying a new opening day for the F-Line, um, but working to do so once that construction schedule and the funding package is really finalized in working with MnDOT. However, we do anticipate that this is a strong project that will remain um, eligible and competitive for federal funding, even on an anticipated revised schedule. So um, moving from the F line now to the H line, our current um, 2024 regional solicitation priority. This would upgrade and extend Route 3, which is one of our highest ridership bus routes, um, from downtown Minneapolis along the Como and Maryland Avenue corridor to St. Paul's east side, ending at the Sunray Transit Center, and making a connection with the Gold Line. It's about a 17-mile corridor. We'd be building approximately 80 new platforms. A platform is one side of the street, so together those two platforms make up a station, about 40 stations along the corridor. We are just in the planning phase right now, um, really beginning the work of engaging our partners and starting to think about engaging more broadly in the community around where those stations would be located. Um, identifying that construction on this project would take place in 2028 and 2029, pending full funding on the corridor. Uh, one thing that is unique about the H line is that it connects to nearly every other line in the existing and planned metro network, um, with the exception of the B line and the red line. Every other 
um, programmed line on the metro system connects with the H line. Again, it really knits together that um, otherwise largely radial network, providing those crosstown connections um, and opening up a lot of access to new jobs and a lot of access to destinations. Um, importantly, we're also working with the Purple Line, which is undergoing a route modification study, taking a closer look at Maryland Avenue, where it's likely that these two projects could share a portion of that alignment. So a lot of course, close coordination with that project. Um, and then just notably, 45% of people who live along this corridor are um, people of color or people who live in low-income households. Really, the areas that we want to focus our transit investments in are served by this corridor. In terms of the project budget and funding, we've identified that this is roughly a $118 million um, project at the preliminary planning level, and the costs will be refined as this is further developed. This is a, a longer project with more stations than have been part of previous arterial BRT projects, and it is the, the highest project budget of arterial, arterial BRT projects to date. Um, that includes about 22 60-foot buses. It includes those 40 stations with um, accessibility improvements and all of the comfortable features that people expect on our arterial BRT system, heat, light, real-time information, off-board fare collection, and um, features for safety and security. And then we have a lot of technology in this corridor too, um, as well as looking at transit signal priority and other ways to speed up bus service. Um, so in addition to the regional solicitation funding, we have identified a portion of um, 2023 bonding that would go to advance some of the early activities on this project. And this project has been included um, at the level of $37 million in the governor's 2024 recommendations for capital investment at the Capitol right now. Um, we also will be identifying um, and evaluating, rather, whether this is a strong candidate for federal funding. We'll be looking at all the opportunities, including uh, the Small Starts program, as possible ways to fund the remainder of this project. And then what comes after the H line? Um, one thing I will note is we won't have an I line because it looks a lot like a one. And so we'll be going right from H <laughs> to J. Uh, <laughs> So as we're getting ready to do this, we're just kicking off this effort right now, planning to initiate this plan in 2024 so that we can wrap it up by the end of 2025 and position the outcomes for the 2026 regional solicitation. Um, we plan to identify three lines the J, K, and L lines to be implemented between 2030 and 2035. We also plan to identify a bench of additional candidate corridors that could be identified for implementation before 2050, which would align with the upcoming transportation policy plan horizon. Um, we anticipate that those two outcomes, the near-term corridors and those additional candidates, would be adopted into the transportation policy plan via an amendment probably sometime in 2026. And in terms of what that plan will do, um, we have a really strong basis to build from, which was the intensive effort we conducted in 2020 and 2021 in the Network Next plan. Uh, the yellow lines on this map are those corridors that were really looked at in detail, but weren't identified as the F, G, or H lines. That's going to be our starting point, looking at high-performing corridors in the region today, um, and also looking at what's changed. Where have other plans changed? Where have investment priorities changed? Um, how can we refresh this to, to start with a good candidate base? Um, we also have had a lot of plans ongoing at Metro Transit. Um, there's a lot of names out there, but Network Now is a current planning effort we are undertaking to look at current service priorities. So we'll be building on that work, um, refreshing our principles and goals and evaluation criteria. And then um, I do want to really highlight, as we're talking about multiple projects in the region, that one of our ongoing efforts is to prioritize and really work with our partners to early align corridor priorities for BRT with local construction plans. So projects that our local partners are bringing through, um, federally funded projects, as Dan mentioned, and others, um, we're seeking to identify those and align priorities. And of course, we'll be engaging the public and partner agencies and stakeholders throughout this process. So much more to come, but I did want to take the opportunity to introduce that today. With that, Chair, I'll stand for any questions. Yeah, excellent presentation, Ms. Roth. Thank you. Uh, questions for Ms. Roth? Member Geisler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to go to uh, Line F, um, since it kind of ends up in my backyard in the area where I'm looking at here. Um, two, two core questions. Mm -hmm. First one is, is a coordination question. Pushing up to 2028, you got F and G then constructing at the same time. Um, is there any concerns about coordinating the, the structures of doing those at the same time, um, considering they were supposed to be two years staggered in the first place? Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Chair and member, um, you're right that if we move out the F-line construction, we will be changing its order in our, our overall queue. A couple of things to that. I say that I'll say that we are going to be working jointly with MnDOT, and so how we resource that construction is something that will be a joint product of MnDOT and Metro Transit figuring out how those pieces work together. Um, so I think you know we have a lot of opportunity to draw on different resources as we do that. The second piece, um, we do anticipate that the G-line will be under construction. Um, actually, portions of it starting this year in coordination with some of the Ramsey County-led work along Rice Street. So we have a lot of staggered work in that corridor already taking place. Um, and then I think you know, what we've seen is that our program is able to accommodate multiple lines in construction at the same time as we do have B-line and E-line underway right now. Um, so we will be working through those steps, um, but you know, part of how we're growing this program is, is trying to scale so that we're able to accommodate some of those pieces. Thank you. The second half of the question. Sure. Um, Go ahead. So looking at, you know, it seems to be the focus on 20, it's the south half of the line. Um, what's happening with the north half? I mean, if MnDOT's not there, if they're not funded, you know, is there a reason why we're not starting up there, knowing that maybe MnDOT may come back? I know we, we hate to do rework, but if it's a little eph ephemeral right now, um, you know, I, I think the big thing that we want to see in the whole point of shifting to that $25 million funding mode was to deliver these faster and more complete. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, unfortunately, the first one we're seeing, we're seeing a two-year push out on this. Um, so I guess my, my question is, how are we going to make sure that we don't keep kicking the can on, on these for the next ones? And, and not to say that we don't trust you and hope it's there, but it's happening here. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we stick to that. So what about the north half? Mr. Chair and member, excellent question. Um, the note that I'll, you'll see on the screen here is that there is a future MnDOT project to follow the F-Line. We do know that in that location, F-Line will be able to proceed without the MnDOT project in place. However, the design for that MnDOT project is still ongoing. So we're working really closely with MnDOT to identify what, if anything, we would be able to advance ahead of that, um, and really anticipating on this corridor that we may have multiple phases of construction that best align with multiple activities in that corridor. Um, so we may see, and I, I don't want to make this guarantee, but we may see that that is some of the first area that we do touch with F-Line construction because of the opportunities that we have elsewhere on the corridor to align. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Karwaski and then Commissioner Martinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Katie, good presentation. I, uh, this arterial bus rapid transit have my kind of high level of interest, I guess. Um, I have a question regarding the um, the H line, which was Maryland Avalon, and then it gets you to downtown Minneapolis. Would that be Larkender then maybe to get you to? Mr. Chair, yeah. member, um, the, the line would travel along Wiper Avenue, um, a little north-south segment, and then mostly along Maryland yeah, to right. roughly where um, Como Park is, at which point it would loop around the lake and continue on Como Avenue, okay. um, cutting through the U of M campus okay. into downtown Minneapolis. Anyhow, um, in, I like the aspect yeah. of it touching in the goal line. That's something that okay. gets out towards wa into Washington County from um, downtown St. Paul. Uh, you mentioned 40 stations a lot. Are those the same as stops? <laughs> a station, in our parlance, consists of two stops on two corners of an intersection. So at an intersection, we've got a station that consists of really the ability to go in each direction at that intersection. Okay. I'm just curious, uh, you know, the the amount of, would you know the amount of time to go from Sunray to downtown Minneapolis? I mean, it does, would it physically stop 40 times? So arterial BRT buses only stop when somebody is waiting at the station or somebody requests to make a stop. Um, so at this point, we've done some high level estimates for what that travel time is, um, but haven't haven't gotten it to a point where, where I have a number yeah. for you today. Uh, anyhow, I'm not disputing it. It's got a lot of potential, a lot of people on that route. My last question is, is um, because you said it was maybe the most expensive RTL bus rapid transit coming it, up. It is the highest uh, cost estimate we have for a project in the development so far. Yep. Put that into perspective. Mm -hmm. Is it just because of its length, as an example, is there kind of a standard cost per mile when you're really, really talking the length of the arterial bus rapid transit driving the cost? I'm curious. 
Good question. So um, for context, um, the D line, which was completed in December of 2022, was a $75 million project that traveled about 18 miles. But there were significantly fewer stations along that line, in part because we designed that to keep a lot of underlying yeah. local service. Whereas on the H line, we will be um, not having local service for large portions of that. So we have slightly more stations to better provide access. Another key driver that we see in the rising costs to deliver these projects is um, simply the escalation that comes with building a project in 2028 and 29 versus 2020. Um, so we have seen, as we have across the industry, costs go up, um, and that is, that is hitting these projects as well. Thank you. Commissioner Martinson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I, I'm very excited about the movement, especially on Rice, Robert. That's been long overdue for our community, so thank you. Um, as you're talking about the next round, mm -hmm. so the, the map that you had yellow lines, I, I'm seeing where things were looked at before, but not seeing the development things that are taking their place, like St. Paul building out the Heights on the eastern part, mm -hmm. almost to Washington County. Um, we've got Arden Hills, which will have 2,000 new units before this even gets approved. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hearing from, at least in Ramsey County, as I'm making rounds with all of our suburban mayors, they're like desperate for more transit outside of St. Paul into our suburban areas where there are jobs, housing, and a need for more housing. How do we get them into that network that isn't already yellow? And the, other, the second part of my question is, you said you'll pick three more lines, which is what you've kind of been doing time after time, but how does three more lines take into account the additional new revenue sources for transit? And is there opportunity to think five or six lines so that we can really start seeing an expansion and not this slow roll of transit when we are doing all the other things I think later we're going to hear about, climate mitigation and all of those things. How do we play a part to make sure that, we can, that we're playing our part in doing all those things quicker than every five years we've got three more lines? Mr. Chair and Member Martinson, um, great questions. I think I might ask you to repeat parts yeah. of that, but I think I got the, the gist of it. In terms of where we're starting from, um, one thing that Arterial BRT is really focused on is building on existing sustained demand, where we have seen uh, a transit market that can support high frequency and then can further support that investment in service. As we think about kind of a spectrum of improvements, um, Arterial BRT is, is at that higher level as we think about um, local service and even newer tools like microtransit as different things that can meet different needs in the region. So we're, we're thinking about one of the tools in the toolbox and truly really trying to build on where we've seen that successful ridership to continue that level of investment. Um, that said, one of the, the early steps we will be taking in this process is to look at what's changed, is to look at those factors that you mentioned and identify where you know, our plans certainly need to be updated from what was last looked at in 2020. And we'll be engaging agency staff stakeholders in those conversations to really help guide what that looks like at the outset of this process. Um, in terms of, I think your next question was, was regarding the, the number of projects in the pipeline. Um, one of the things that we have, have continued to see as we build out this program is that a lot of the pace of building these projects out is at the speed of partnership that we can really deliver in this region. Because so many of these investments are tied to other program projects, be it a Highway 65 investment, be it Rice and Robert Streets or other pieces, um, we have found that that is a, a very um, good barometer for how quickly we can build out this pipeline. Um, and delivering those three projects over that five-year time frame is, is approximately correlated to that level of, of ability to do so. Um, so I will say that one of the reasons, though, that we want to take that broader look out to 2050 is to identify where else could be ripe as we are thinking about that pipeline. So having that opportunity to go further down the list exists in the way we're structuring our plan update to have that broader look. Was there another question that you had that I didn't touch on? I, no, I think you answered that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, thank you. I, you answered the questions. I guess I would just put a plug in, is especially as we're thinking about new large-scale projects in Ramsey County in particular with either the Heights or Arden Hills um, and what that development looks like, It there wouldn't be ridership now because there's 
there's no transit there now and there's no housing, but we know that before this is decided, there will be 2,000 new units with up to you know, 3,000 more people in the affordable range. So we wanna make sure that we're planning for both and that we're not waiting for ridership numbers, but we're actually deciding that we're putting transit where we know it will be needed. So just wanna put a plug in that. All right, Member Johnson and Member Barber and back over Member Foster. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll just start with a comment. I mean, the D-line opened near me. I mean, it was, I rode the five maybe two, three times before that. D-line opened and I was like, I'll give this a try. It was always packed. I mean, just incredibly busy going both directions and just got me where I wanted to go. I mean, if it was just into downtown, it was a great connection just to walk a couple blocks and then just take it in. So, you know, for me, it was a very, it changed the way I was looking at transit in my own neighborhood, which was very cool to see it connected to a lot of their systems. And I'm excited to see the network grow. I mean, it's getting to that point now where you can start seeing those network effects where you can take, you know, the blue line to the A line and then get to your destination. And you're not worried about what the schedule is. I just show up at a stop and then just go where I want to go. It's fantastic. I mean, to be blunt, it's it's fantastic. So again, I think Member Barton already talked about the one particular thing is, but you know, for the our part here at the regional solicitation, I mean, we have twenty five million dollars that basically just goes towards these projects every other year. So that's another constraint on how quickly we can do this. You know, there's something for us to think about with um, how we're providing money into this into this system. And I'm also really glad to hear that the addressing of delay is something with the coordination with projects, because there's a lot of people I, they saw the headline of the F line is delayed, and these are transit people who are excited about this project, and they were like, what are they even doing? So to hear like the reason why we're coordinating a bunch of projects, we're trying to make sure that we're learning from this experience and then doing better in the next section, I think is really valuable, because when the headline is, it's delayed longer, it's another transit project that's delayed, people don't like it. So I'm really glad to hear that. The one specific question I have is, as you're thinking about the network, I, I'm thinking about you know most of these go through one of the downtowns or dead end in one of the downtowns. I'm just channeling my dad at one of those points where he he was complaining about why does nothing connect outside of that? And so I can point to, well, Maryland, you know, goes off and does not connect in the same way. But I'm wondering about um, just sort of the interconnectedness of this network, where we see the possibilities building proactively with where we have things going in. And also just that, you know, like for example, the C line, you know, is an extension of the C line part of this mix where it's not upgrading a particular route, but it is just terminating in downtown Minneapolis and doesn't go anywhere. So Cedar, Bloomington, like is that part of the mix as you're talking about those next steps? Mr. Chair, member, great questions. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the, the um, Como, Maryland route being not one that goes into downtown. Um, it's also not where our route goes today. And so as part of this process, through identifying both the G line, um, which connects two pieces of two routes that aren't interlined today, and then looking at those connections further to the east side, um, that's an example of being able to make some changes to that network to respond to how, not to how things are necessarily, but how there will be changes going forward. Um, so to your question about the sea line and how we're thinking about these other pieces, I do expect that that sort of linkages within the network will be something that we're looking at in this plan. Um, it's a good example. Um, previously, we looked at the West Broadway Cedar Corridor. Obviously, since that last time, now West Broadway is going to be the site of the Blue Line extension. Um, and so we don't anticipate looking at that for additionally arterial BRT investments, which might mean we're looking at different pieces of those north-south components and how they might link up. Um, so I do expect very much that those ideas you're raising are things that will be in the realm of, of this plan update. Thank you. All right, good. Member Barber, then Member Foster, and then we'll uh, move on to the next topic so we can right. get, get you all out here on time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of quick things um, to uh, Commissioner Martinson. Uh, definitely, um, I totally understand what you're talking about. The Network Now program really is one thing. Um, that we're looking at of, of how are we changing where we provide service because we know that things have changed and we know that some of those changes are permanent but we're still trying to figure out what's permanent what's not but also I would say we're undergoing an update of transportation policy plan as part of our, our overall um, um, uh, 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 yeah, updates for regional planning and um, with that one of the things we do is highlight studies in there and my experience here is the studies help drive the investment and so if there's some ties to land use or things like that with these new developments of do, how do we factor that in to maybe highlight some of these things so um, I would love to maybe connect with you offline a little bit on it and then to um, follow up to member Johnson um, you know he actually just bringing up the conversation of 
only rode the Route 5 a few times and rides the D-Line all the time. Um, what we found since um, the ABRT system on the D-Line's been in place, that the ridership in the corridor, the Route 5 and the D-Line, has gone up 87% in one year. And that reflects an overall uh, like 120% growth in the ABRT system in one year. And what that comes to is actually, it was um, almost 4 million rides last year. And so I really want to thank Tab and all of you for our continued focus on this program and, and the willingness to invest. I think you know the investment coming from this group helps um, motivate the legislature to help us from a bonding perspective and some of these other things and how we've really been able to do it and working with some of our local partners, like I said, to, to, to do these improvements in a wise manner. So we're only disrupting communities once and things like that. So you know, much appreciation because I think it's been successful because of all the partnerships. So just thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Those observations, Member Barber, Member Foster, yeah, give the I, last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to follow up on what Member Martinson said. We were in the regional solicitation evaluation meeting earlier this morning, and when you talk about like building projects for the demand that exists now, I just go back to what what is the demand? I mean, I guess the demand that we could induce by really expanding how we're going to build out ABRT and where. I, I'm also curious, like, so if we're going to start to move into network now, will the bar for consideration be lowered? Like for a route to be, for a corridor to be considered development into ABRT, what will the bar then be? Does that make sense? I'm not sure I'm like naming it. I think so, Mr. Chair and, uh, and Member Foster. Um, I'll just, maybe to answer your question, really note that our work to identify the next arterial yes. BRT corridors is going to build on network now and okay. what's happening in that process. It's also going to build on what's happening in the transportation policy plan right now. Got it. And so those will be two key efforts that we'll layer onto okay. um, versus recreate in order to identify those next lines. Okay, that helped, thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you. All right, All right. Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Ms. Ross. All right, uh, that was a really interesting conversation. Uh, and here's another person that's been doing some great work at the staff level, Cole Henniker. Uh, the whole group of uh, folks internally and then uh, all the people working on the transportation policy plan for 2050. Uh, Jed Hansen's here as well. He's been a, a great support, uh, I think, for Cole and, and all of us that are working on the TPP. So welcome uh, and look forward to the presentation here in the update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as he's bringing it up, we, we're going to keep it relatively short today just so we can get to the last information item. And really, this is a check-in and an opportunity for us to start sharing information with TAB. So the, a reminder that we have a structure to work on the 2050 TPP that includes various advisory groups. Those groups have been working tirelessly over the last two years to help us produce a good draft. And we're starting to get to the point where we have draft documents for the long-range plan, and you'll start seeing them actually immediately after this meeting. So the TPP technical working group is a staff level group that's been helping us. They meet monthly. Uh, the advisory work group is, is a, a mixture of TAB, Met Council, and, and agency staff um, that also meets approximately monthly. And so that's been occurring for quite a while now. In terms of where we're at with the overall schedule, we're in this, at the, this phase of final plan prep and beginning to start uh, producing content that'll, that'll move forward into a more public comment process. So we're in the, I would say, the informal review stage right now where we're working with partners to, to, to share drafts and review content. That formal public comment process is going to start at TAC planning in June. So we're only a few months away from official actions uh, on the TPP to release it for public comment. Um, this is just a high-level summary of what we've done over the last two years. You know, we started with some evaluation of our system. Uh, we did uh, a lot of work with, with studies. There's just a few examples here. Those are really things to help inform priorities and policies in the TPP on topical specific areas. So a couple of examples there, but there were many other studies that contributed to the TPP. Uh, we did a number of listening sessions uh, last spring. 
And uh, by the way, the, the blue underlined bullets here, if you have the content, those are links to summaries of those, either the evaluation or the listening <laughs> sessions. We, we formed a number of technical committees to work on developing policies and actions, and that's a document you're actually gonna be shared with you after this meeting. So just note that went through a very elaborate process with, with staff from across the region to help us develop those draft policies and actions. Um, we also developed funding assumptions, and while it's not specifically focused next month with Amy Venowitz's presentation on the TPP, a lot of the work she's gonna summarize is work that went into the development of our funding assumptions. And you can imagine we had to sort of pivot pretty strongly uh, after the legislative session uh, last year, and so that was a lot of work uh, to ca capture in the last fall before we produced that draft. Um, and then I, I noted the working groups that we've had um, over 30, 30 meetings of those groups. So we, we started by review, reviewing content with the technical working group, and this just gives you a sense for how we've staggered it. We recognize it's a lot of content. You know, in total, there's, there's over 300 pages of content that they've reviewed over the last couple of months. Uh, so you can note that we, we start by giving them a few chapters to review. Uh, we hear their feedback for a month. We give them a month to comment. And then we, we talk to them about their themes at their next meeting and then introduce new content. And so that's the process we've gone through. At this point, they, they've reviewed um, all of the content to the last line. And that last line, the work program was just shared with them earlier this month. We're gonna focus on actually the middle for you all. We're gonna share the goals, chapters, and the policies and actions after this meeting. And then after the April <coughs> meeting, we'll come back and share the other content with you all. So I wanted to give you a little bit of guidance. Um, this is actually a lot of content to review. I know it's, it's a lot to ask of you all, so if you have limited time, maybe some tips for how to review it. Uh, the five goals ch chapters all have a similar outline. They have an overview of what the goal is, what the related transportation policy plan objectives are, essentially a summary of what we're trying to achieve. Some relationship, you know, not all of these goals are independent. You know, there's a lot of relationships between safety and equity and dynamic and resilient. Um, there's a placeholder section for performance measures. We don't quite have those ready yet, so it's just placeholder language for now. The bulk of these chapters are around the context. Why does this goal matter? What is the, what is the issue that we're trying to solve with this goal in a relationship to transportation in particular? So that's, that's where we really feel like URL's content will be the most helpful. Make sure we're framing these issues up correctly that all parts of the region feel represented and that it, it looks like, you know, it really makes sense how we're, we're talking about this issue. Um, there's sections then on how we implement, uh, how we basically how we address those goals. Um, those are, are very high level because the investment plans are what actually get into the more detail. And so those sections are a little <laughs> bit shorter, but they give you some sense of um, how we're going to be addressing those goals. So when you're reviewing it, you know, I think one thing that's always helpful for us to hear is are there ways to more simply talk about some of these things? You know, we, we very quickly get into the weeds. So if you think, you know, oh, this would be really great to represent with a graphic or some sort of um, relationship, those are always helpful. Stories, pictures, anything like that. Um, any context that you think might be missing, you know, if we talk about climate change and you say, well, why don't you talk about this? It's really important relative to climate change. Those are always helpful for us to think about and consider. Um, there might be some overlap between the chapters, you know, if you think there's too much or too little, that's always helpful for us to hear. Um, and then there's some notes in there about placeholders exist, you know, we might have highlighted them in yellow, content that we still haven't developed, but we wanted to get these drafts out without waiting for the, you know, finally polished versions. Um, in particular, if there's stories from your community that can help tell us a story, you know, we don't know every community what they're doing, so those are always helpful if you, if you know of a project idea or any kind of work that's going on in your community. Um, the investment plans will be coming next month. Those similarly have uh, pretty consistent uh, outlines in terms of talking about what the system is. They're, they're generally focused around a system like transit, bike, pad, or highways. Um, they have an elaborate section on the investment plans. What are the different programs we fund? List of any assumed investments in the long range plan and then any planning direction to our partners that work on those modes. Um, we've been getting a lot of technical feedback on these. I think we have over 2,000 comments to date from our partners on these, on these chapters. Um, a lot of the, the feedback has been focused around content, around uh, roles and responsibilities. And oftentimes it's, it's can, you can, you, can you tweak this language because it better represents our role on this project or this, this system. 
Um, a lot of questions about the context for the framing of the mode. You know, can you explain more why a regional bike system matters, things like that. Um, better tying back our language throughout the chapter to the goals. You know, when we're talking about highways, it's, it's a 40 page chapter. Can we weave in the, the notions of climate and safety all throughout the chapter rather than limiting it to one section? Um, and then again, suggestions to highlight local projects or state work that might relate to that. You know, the TPP is not just about directing the council's work, it's about um, giving guidance to all of our partners. The one concern that I think we've heard that I wanted to highlight here is there was con concerns about the highway mobility sections being um, in conflict with some of our goals, particularly climate change and the potential negative outcomes. Um, I don't think we're ready to talk about that at TAB or the TPP groups, but if you wanna look through some of these chapters and highlight those issues, that would be helpful for us to know. Um, last slide for me before I turn it over to Jed is um, that this is really the outlook. So starting today, um, we are gonna be sharing 88 pages total, broken into uh, six chapters. That's the five chapters that are building on the regional goals and the policies and actions. Um, these, these drafts that you're seeing do not reflect any changes from the feedback we've received from the technical partners. Uh, we're still getting that feedback from them. So you're getting the same versions that they all saw for those particular versions. Um, I wanted to note that we're also sharing these, these drafts with Met Council members and TAC at the same time. So if you do wanna coordinate with your TAC member, this would be the time to do it. They're gonna be getting the, the chapters today as well. Um, next month, we'll, we'll be sharing more content with you all, nine investment plan chapters totaling 211 pages. Um, we expect you to review every, every single page of that um, before the next meeting. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but we do, we do want to note that, that that has been reviewed thoroughly by our technical partners, so you might want to check in with them if you have staff that had an opportunity to review and see if they had issues that you should focus on. I would also note uh, for anyone else that maybe doesn't have staff, think about a topic that's really important to you. You know, if you really, if you really care about bike ped planning, just focus on that chapter. I know it's gonna be a lot to tackle in one month, so try to prioritize it within your own um, area of expertise. And we do have time potentially reserved for future TAB meetings. You know, if you see something in one of these chapters and you're like, you know, this seems like a really big issue for us, is this something that we could discuss further at a TAB uh, meeting? That would be helpful to know. Um, Jed will probably cover this, but I'm just gonna say this first up front. Uh, we are sharing these chapters with you individually. You cannot discuss them with other members of TAB that would violate open meeting laws. So you can only send comments directly back to staff and we will summarize them at a future meeting. So make sure not to talk about the content you're seeing amongst members between the meetings and not in a public forum. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jed. He's gonna explain how we're taking comments. So, All right. Thanks, cool. All right, so Mr. you can Chief, send. Yep. Sense. Yeah, can I, can I just raise a question yes. here? So, um, in the, the we, we've this open meeting thing, and um, I just want a little bit of clarification. Comments, uh, the public will be able to attribute specific comments to individuals, correct? If somebody says we want Commissioner Martinson and Holberg's comments provided in this, you will be providing that, correct? Correct. So when. Uh, our plan is when when you provide us comments, we will summarize them. Our focus on our summary report is not going to be on individual identified comments. However, any comments that you do provide us are public data and anyone can request it. And just to be clear, in this feedback loop, you are, the issue of a serial meeting is for some of us very important. So how are you, you going to make sure that the constraints of the open meeting law and avoiding a serial meeting, i.e. IB, decisions being made or options being limited by the compilation of all this input? Mm. So the case can be made that if the majority of people say, I wanna talk about this some more, but not this, as a matter of the feedback process, by you are by virtue of the process making a decision outside of an open meeting. You mean for a future agenda topic? Or whatever, I mean, I, you can say that you're not making decisions, but just the fact that you're summarizing 
purpose of the open meeting law is to make sure that the public can have wide open access to any decision making process of a public body. So even the element of summarizing to drive future discussion for the purists would, would contend that that is not at least at the very least adhering to the spirit of the open meeting law and its purpose. And yeah. I understand people hate this. I mean, right. It's, right. This is, it causes headaches, gray hair for staff. As individuals, we would have a variety on a spectrum of where the line is, where you're into the gray. Some of us prefer to operate as far away from the gray, let alone the line as possible. The line is often defined differently depending on who you ask. So. I, I think you got to be really careful, and I would, uh, the summary, I, I, I think you, you you would even have to post, I, I don't know, I, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, well, let's hear what their ideas are on how to deal with this issue, because so this we, is a Yeah, so, um, Mr. Chair, we, and, and Member Holberg, we did check in with our legal counsel. They feel comfortable that as long as, as you do not discuss it as a group, and that we are able to provide a summary of the comments to anyone that requests that it is okay and that your eventual action on the item to release it for public comment could take into account the feedback that was received. Um, and so they were comfortable with it, but we can certainly relay that feedback and see if they have additional thoughts on that. Um, for now, it's really just to help us you know, create a better draft that we can then act on at a future meeting, right? I think you should check with them on this issue that's been raised here. Directly I, I, by Commissioner Holberg and uh, inferentially by Commissioner Martinson. I, I would just say that I would think in order to go beyond any type of question, I would at least as an individual request that all input of individual members of TAB be publicly available as a part of the agenda item readily available and not have to be requested. Yeah, we, we can certainly do that. We we. We didn't want to do that with the 2,000 technical comments that we got, if that's fair, but I think we can do that for the, for the public boards. And um, what we would plan to do is maybe post it at the next meeting as, as like an information item follow-up from the request. And then you guys could discuss it as a group, the comments that right. you submitted. And not that that would allay my concerns or meet my standards, but right. it would get closer. Appreciate the feedback. Okay. Um, right. So uh, we will follow up and on, on that item. Um, that said, your response will, would be appreciated most by April 12th, so we can prepare um, uh, materials for the next TAB meeting. Um, Cole noted you'll see some overlap in the chapters and, and placeholders. Um, we're gonna ask that if you have specific language suggestions, please leave them in a comment on a document and not use track changes. When we're consolidating <laughs> information, it is about impossible to, to take track changes from five people, let alone 34. Um, so I, I would greatly appreciate this. Um, and, and we've already covered this, but please provide those comments individually. Um, here's an example of uh, leaving comments in a Microsoft Word document. Um, this is our preferred form. We, we can accommodate other forms. Um, so just work with me uh, on what format you'll be providing your comments in. And just a, a second reminder, no track changes, please. Um, we've discussed this open meeting topic and, and we need to come back to it. Uh, the message that we'll send out to the tab today does have a guidance document that we reviewed with council's office and we may follow up with response to Commissioner Holberg's feedback later on. Okay. It's, it's a lot, uh, I'll give you that. Member Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So one just logistic question, is this going to seated tab members or including alternates as well? I think we would welcome alternates. I don't know, Elaine, if that's generally the procedure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No, good question. My, e my email list has both. No. So when I send something out, it goes to everyone. Okay, thank you. For sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, Cole and Jed, uh, a lot of us are on that uh, TPP <coughs> meeting that you're 
all this work that's been going on for about a year. Great job. I know there's other <coughs> staff that are participating, so I think you're all doing a great job. And us among seven counties to try to get a regional approach and vision is not always easy. A lot of opinions on uh, the direction, but you're making the most of it. Really appreciate the effort, so I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, somebody have, okay. I want to make sure, Mr. Member Heeman, that you didn't have a question. I didn't. Thank you, though. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, now, John Solberg and Chris Behrens are going to come back up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just in the uh, interest of everybody's time, I'll, I'm going to introduce this. Um, in part because the Department of Transportation will be back several times over the next couple months. So again, my name is John Solberg. I'm the Assistant Division Director for Sustainability Planning and Program Management at the Department. Chris Behrens has been leading our greenhouse gas work group uh, that came as a result of the legislation last year. And so you guys have the presentation, but what I want you to know is that legislation came to the Department last year. It came with the instruction to develop a work group. That work group consisted of two county, two city, uh, MPO, RDCs, and some advocate uh, folks that were able to come together over the last uh, seven, eight months and make recommendations back to the legislature. Those recommendations have primarily been incorporated into House File 4988. And for everybody here, it ties all those discussions that you've had today about expansion, climate, policy, it all is tied together because effectively what that law does is asks transportation uh, agencies, MPOs, to look at the cost of building the system and its impacts on the environment and our, our people. So it looks at that through greenhouse gas and through VMT. Um, as in, right, building these roads if they get bigger and bigger and what that impact is on neighborhoods. Um, but it also, the new uh, statute, or the, I should say, the legislation that's been introduced will also provide a small level of funding at this point that will ease transportation agencies into that. So it becomes over time, much like, and many of you probably aren't familiar, uh, wetland banking. So it's, it's if your road goes through a wetland, you have to replace that wetland and maybe then some. Um, and effectively what they're asking for is look at these pieces, mitigate for them. It's part of the road system that we owe to, the, um, to our folks uh, that use the system and live in this world. So, I just want to leave it at a high level, wanted to make sure I get it introduced. We will be back. This assessment is required to be in place by February 1st of 2025, uh, which is not long, but we have a framework in place to do the assessment. And we will be working over the next nine months to get that built out and to figure out what mitigation is. One of the last components of that legislation or the proposed changes are a technical technical committee that will help the department decide what is appropriate modeling, what is appropriate uh, offsets. So with that, I will stand for any questions so that you guys can get out of here on time. Member Greisler. Mr. Solberg, is, and, and you're well aware of the regional solicitation and we're gonna re revise it here. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting about this program is the heavy focus on VMP reduction. As you know, on roadways, one of the highest scoring attributes is usage. So we give a lot of points to where there's a lot of VMTs happening. Um, has there been any discussion or is there any place where maybe MnDOT can weigh in on how do we harmonize those two concepts of making investments in very busy places, but also trying to achieve VMTs because those are pretty counterproductive of driving funds to places to reduce VMTs, but also making sure they're going where they're needed. Um, these goals are pretty juxtaposed. I've heard, I've heard from it from my county engineer, uh, which is speaking a lot that he calls a citizen rep for that. So <laughs> I, I think guidance here would be great uh, as we come into revising for the next round. I, uh, Mr. Chair yeah. and uh, Member Geisler. So yes, this is a large issue. Um, we've been working the last seven months really on just trying to get this as a recommendation back to the legislature, but your comment is not unnoticed by anybody. 
Um, right? We talk about VMT, we talk about, well, we want to drive traffic to our businesses and have a successful economy. I think the other component of that is just thinking about how do we make available options to people, right? So it doesn't always have to be driving. Maybe it could be riding an electric bike. Maybe it could be uh, transit, as folks were talking about network next here, and going into networks or areas that aren't already developed, because that may provide those types of transportation to them. It's a big, uh, it's a big topic. The nice thing that I think we're looking at from a department standpoint is the intent from the legislator who put this forward in the first place. It's about progress, it's not about perfection. So let's make these incremental steps and move forward. Okay, Member Jenkins. That, Member Greisler, do you have any follow on? Uh, this is, it, it's very early, I know there's a lot coming from, I just wanted to get it out yeah. there that, that okay. those things need to connect when we move to forward. This point. Member Jenkins. Thank you, Chair. So I know today, statewide, it's less than 1% of EV um, electric vehicles on the roads. Does your forecasting take into an account an increase in electric vehicles in vehicle miles traveled so that we're not discrediting those efforts at greenhouse gas emissions? So, Chair, uh, Commissioner Jenkins, I think one of the things we're looking at is, is electrification is one point towards, um, towards clean climate. VMT is also an indicator of just the health of the other systems. So they aren't necessarily one and the same, um, but they are pieces, and I don't know if Chris has more to add to this, but they are pieces that we have to really parse out because if you go all electric, let's just say that, right? Mm -hmm. And volumes continue to grow on our roadways. That still has impacts in the neighborhood. It still has particulate matter that is going into the air. Um, so you, there's, it, it's not an all or one. It's, it's a combination of both components. So that wasn't a real good answer for you. Maybe Chris <laughs> has got the specific for you. I think that's a pretty good answer. Okay. That works. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, Commissioner Martinson and Commissioner Holberg. Yeah, I, I almost wish we would have had this conversation and presentation first on our agenda today because I do think that this is an overarching umbrella on everything else that we're talking about. We, I'm wondering what our role as the TAB and the Met Council is uh, on <coughs> making sure this happens from a regional approach. We cannot do one vehicle at a time statewide and think we're going to have an impact. We have to think about a regional approach. And as we're thinking about investments, the regional solicitation, we have to really think about how we're grading all of our projects based on the reduction and mitigation factors. So I, I'm, I feel terrible that it's 235 and we're getting to the most important presentation, I feel, of how we do our work over the next two years. And so I'm going to ask, Mr. Chair, if you would put on the agenda that we can come back and have a deeper conversation before we get to the things that Cole brought up and we think about regional solicitation because but for what this leg legislation implies, we're not going to be able to help you achieve your goals and we have our overall responsibility. I just wanted to put that on the table. He responds, all right, all right. Mr. Holbrook, we are happy to come back. Thank you. Yeah, I, do, I know you'd be happy to come back and throw more. Yeah, just, just real quick, I, the, MnDOT also has a vehicle. My comments were to Chris's comments. MnDOT has a vehicle mile travel reduction right. working group that um, I'm serving on, and uh, they, you know, they're going to employ a whole variety of things. We're just starting. We're kind of waiting to see what the legislature does with the craft bill and fixing it and does the February 25th hold. And they've, MnDOT's done some initial surveying and pretty mm -hmm. clear that about half the population doesn't see any value in reducing vehicle miles. They don't see it as an issue. There's a lot of work to be done. The, the initial study shows if you tell them, uh, you know, other things other than climate, you know, like saving money and other, you, yep. get, you get people to buy in for different reasons. So MnDOT's really digging in about how can we make progress on this goal and a variety of ideas are on the table. And again, once the legislature figures out where they're going with this, we're kind of a sideshow, but working very diligently to put meaningful options. Because as you can also, 
probably predict there's a lot of resistance to this in Greater Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Member Martinson. Thank you, Commissioner. Member Martinson, then Member Geisler. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I've, I've read the report that was issued. I've read most of the meeting minutes, and I've read the legislation, the original, and also House File 4988. And I just wanted to, so my understanding is that the working group is now disbanded. It's, it's expired as of the issuance of the report, is it not? Can you uh, clarify? Mr. Chair, uh, Member Martinson, no. We are still continuing with the work group right now because two parts. Um, right, there are still questions that come up through this process and we're trying to uh, answer some of those as we can. Also, they are our sounding body for parts of, for instance, one of the recommendations that you saw in 4988 is that technical committee, but it doesn't have membership to it. We put that to the work group to ask, well, who should that be? Who do you think that should be? And I just wanna really commend that work group. It, it, when we started the process, we thought we were gonna have two different camps and it was gonna be really hard to come together. Uh, but this work group has really come together with ideas and, and presenting uh, information in a thoughtful manner. But so that work group will continue in our mind until we can get that technical uh, group stood up. There's nothing that prohibits us from continuing a work group after that uh, either. Very, very good, because there's language in the legislation that says expires as of either February 1st or, or sorry, when, when, the, when the report was issued or February 1st of 2025. So then to my, then to my other point is in, in, the, in, in the legislation that's been introduced by Representative Kraft, the language has been changed, and I understand that this is at the behest of the EPA, to uh, mostly remove the word mitigation. Greenhouse gas mitigation has been replaced with a term throughout the legislation of offsets. Offsets to me is a problematic word because it is much more narrow than mitigation and it, and it speaks primarily to a swapping system, a credit swap system. And that is not a avoidance of greenhouse gas or alleviation of greenhouse gas or anything else that would be mitigation that's not trading uh, you know, and, and carbon credits, right? So it's like a carbon credit market. So I'm concerned about that language because if every sector that's trying to reduce our greenhouse gas, every sector is thinking about credit swaps, as near as I can tell. Uh, and, and if everyone is saying we're gonna trade credit swaps with everybody else, nobody's gonna be actually reducing greenhouse gases. And I see the working group, and I agree with you. Thank you for the work that they've done. It's great, and, 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 it, was, and it was great to see the very heavy lifting that was being done by that group. So let me say that, I, I really do appreciate the work, but I'm concerned about that language, and I would like to see some something else other than offsets be used because that really suggests a leaning heavily into credit swapping. And I just don't think that's gonna get us where we need to be ultimately, so. Comment? It, sure, Commissioner, uh, Chair. I think uh, for us, the intent of that was to get away from what was FHWA, Federal Highway Administration, real concern about what is the NEPA process and a very legal definition of mitigation and so we, were move, we moved towards <coughs> offset, not with the intent that it's a swapping of carbon credits necessarily, but how are we taking down these credits to get to these targets? And without saying something like taking down these targets, right? <laughs> and so, uh, but uh, I think there were other folks that had some concern about that language, but ultimately the intent is what carried through with that, that term. Member Geisler has decided he doesn't need to ask any mm. question, but um, you know we we know when you started this work a year or two ago, you were trying to get your arms around it, and it sounds like you're you're working your way there. And Commissioner Holberg made some excellent points. I thought uh, when you think you can be helpful to us on guiding us on some of the work that we're doing, to Commissioner Martinson's point, tell us when you want to come back because we're, we're ready for that information in conjunction with the next solicitation. It's something that we've wanted for some period of time, and I think it would be really helpful to have that guidance as we do the work that we do. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And of course, we are in uh, constant contact with Met Council staff, certainly during the TPP development, but as part of the requirements, and I wanna make sure folks know, uh, there is now a federal measure for greenhouse gas that um, the council is responsible for setting. Uh, which will follow what the state did, I, I, I understand. Um, and then we'll be back uh, to talk more about this, this process. 
And then in the fall, one of the other things that this legislation did is talked about sub-allocation of greenhouse gas. So right now we have a statewide measure. Um, in the fall, we will need to set that sub-allocation, which could be different for different regions, it could be the same, um, but those are certainly questions that we will need to come to the council for to get your input on that process, but ultimately I just wanna make sure folks understand it is the commissioner that is responsible for setting those. All right. So we will be back in, in no doubt for that, but also uh, to continue talking about these pieces. Yeah. Very good, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I don't want us to be passive in this role. I, I do think that um, based on the fact that the commissioner is gonna set this, we are gonna have to be so thank you for your work and we're gonna be uh, need to be out ahead of this work group to say what is it that we see as a priority? How are we gonna play a role in mitigation and take action so that we can then share that information to the commissioner and help influence what the final sub allocation will be. If we wait for to be responsive, we're gonna be too late to the table. And so my emphasis is for us to fully understand what this means so that we can get out ahead because the Commissioner will take our input to determine, but, uh, but if we wait until he tells us, we don't have a say. So I really want TAB and the Met Council to lean into how are we taking action and whether it's in our solicitation process and our policies to say, how are we mitigating greenhouse gas as a region? It's the only way the state's gonna make their goals. This is the population base and we have a responsibility. So I just want us to not be reactive, but proactive yeah. in this case. And you may, I may not have articulated very well what I wanted. I, whatever information they have that's helpful to us in yeah. setting greenhouse gas reduction targets, that, that's a good thing. And, yeah. and, and you will be happy to hear that next month at the tab, Excellent. we'll be talking about greenhouse gas reduction Excellent. targets. Excellent. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Well, and it took Colorado like three years to do, to do this. So. Yeah. And we're at about eight months, so we're on whirlwind pace. Right. Member Johnson, did you have something that you wanted to add? I did, and I'll be very quick. So one thing that came up on the info call for the uh, appointed members on Monday was just what specific role TAB is going to have. And so one piece was the regional solicitation, you know, what can we change in that process? But the other one was it sounded like there was something about, you know, because we might be the deciding group for the MPO related to transportation things that we might have to either task staff with giving us, you know, set up some process with, you know, does this meet the requirements? You know, does this do the mitigation it's supposed to? Does this project qualify? And then we potentially would be the deciding group that says, yes, indeed, this does meet the requirement. And so, again, I realize nothing's been decided at these points, but I mean, if we are representing the MPO for transportation pieces, that's an additional thing that we have to do here that we have to be thinking about. So I'm curious if you can give any commentary on like, sort of where we anticipate this going, because we're also all kind of in the dark as TAB members at this point. Sure, um, Chair, Member Johnson, I think, um, yes, it's very much still up in the air. Part of that is, and I will um, reiterate, the language is being amended, um, right? The language right now is project level evaluation. The recommendation in the new language is talking about portfolio or, or program level. And it talks about that those programs eventually by 2030 uh, have to be uh, doing that evaluation. Okay, so there's, there's a little bit of time to build into the process, number one. Number two, that process could be um, just at the MPO level or ATP level, or it could be at the statewide level. Those are pieces that we have to figure out what is the best way to move this forward. Um, I, I have thoughts on it, but those are just my thoughts. That is not a position that we have as a department yet, or as the technical working group will help us uh, make decisions on. So sorry, I can't get any more specific. No, and just if I can add on, um, then that means it's an opportunity for us at TAB to say what we would potentially like to have the MPO's role to be. Okay. And, and uh, Mr. Chair and Member Johnson, I will say this has been a discussion with the MPO uh, administrators. Um, we've, we've gone to them in, at different levels uh, to talk to them about, well, this is the process. How do you want to be involved? And so certainly they are uh, hearing some of that as well. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Pay, you got the last word. Mr. Chair, thank you. John, you had mentioned about the uh, sub-allocation and definitely section 64 and 
as we develop that target or if that target is already set and how that's going to break down then into individual entities slash the cities and the counties <coughs> and how are we going to be able to reach that target do you think that's going to happen within the next six months so mr chair uh tab member fay so one of the things is we are charged with that and it is again a february uh deadline on that so it's not really a matter of if we think it's going to it's going to um, the second part of that is we're charged with the feasibility. So we're going to look at various feasible options that will be um, that we can bring forward to throughout the state. And at this point, we're looking at it at a regional level. It's not sub allocated below that. Um, that said, though, we need to look at the feasibility of the, these different options. And that's part of what will be coming back to the regions as a whole. Uh, in July, August timeframe. So we would like to definitely be back here in July if possible. And then just the definition of what the region is, is that Minneapolis, St. Paul, or is that the seven county metro area? So specifically, Chair and uh, Member Fahey, we have to, in legislation, do it for the Met Council, but it really needs to extend throughout the state. And so we will be looking at how the population centers, the MPOs, and then potentially following the Colorado model as a potential feasible option, where the MPOs had allocations, and then the rest of the state, the rural parts of the state, had a separate allocation. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you. Mr. Solberg, thanks for being here. Always, Thank you. Always nice to have you here. Um, anything for the good of the order? Thanks for hanging in there with us, folks, on an important topic. So we stand adjourned. Mm -hmm.